What's up, FRT community? Hey, today, okay, I'm just gonna be honest. I'm gonna self-indulge just a little bit. I'm gonna talk about a big passion of mine that is being driving pressure. I think driving pressure has a big role in the future of mechanical ventilation, and today, I'm gonna tell you why. Let's dive in. All right, so we know we're talking about driving pressure today. And I wanna share with you just a little bit of the things that I've discovered in looking more into driving pressure so that you may have a better understanding of why is it important and two, how do we define it and what does it actually mean for us and our patients at the bedside? How can we apply it to those situations? So let me start with the study that I saw presented back in about 2017. Now this is a meta-analysis to where the ARSNET protocols authors, so the original writers of the of the ARSNET protocol, from the from the implementation of it back in the early 2000s, went back in it and then published an article in 2015, kind of relaying what they learned from the patients that had been utilized in this protocol. Now, if you remember the ARSNET protocol, you remember there was a big emphasis on smaller tidal volumes with a big emphasis on, on, on plateau pressure. And then we were gonna utilize more effective peep levels. Now, if you remember, the tidal volume was gonna be based off of six to eight mLs per kilogram, and we could go down to as low as four mLs per kilogram if we needed to, based off of varying plateau pressures. And when they came back and looked at this, they looked at about 35 to 3,600 studies, different patients, and they put them in groups of likeness. So you can see here in this first group right here, what they did is they said, let's put all of our peeps together first. So everybody with the same peep, let's look at that first. And then they divided them up in, so you can see everybody here has a peep of about 10. And then they said, okay, now let's look at what happened when anybody on a peep of 10 had a different plateau pressure. And you can see here, they saw several different groups with varying levels of plateau pressures. Now, we're going to talk about this in a second, but you have to understand that, that driving pressure is plateau minus peep. That is the formula for driving pressure. So, as the difference between plateau pressure and peep gets larger, driving pressure goes up. Over here, you have a very small driving pressure. Over here, you have a very large driving pressure. Now, everybody's on the same peep, but we have different driving pressures because we have different plateau pressures. This lower part right here shows the risk of mortality. So you can see here where as driving pressure goes up, so does mortality. Or should we say as plateau pressure goes up with a set peep, so does mortality. Now if you flip over here to the group C, over here what they said they were going to do is they're going to say, okay, Let's not look at peak this time. Now let's look at plateau pressure. Let's put all the plateau pressures together. And so they said, okay, well, everybody with a plateau pressure of 28, we're going to put over here. And we're going to divide this up multiple different ways. And some patients had different levels of peeps. So you can see here where the peeps started at somewhere around 5 and looks like they peak out somewhere around 15. Well, again, the difference between plateau and peep is driving pressure. So much larger driver pressure here versus here. And look what happened. Very high mortality, lower mortality. It went down as the driving pressure went down. So what they pulled away from this was that, okay, it's obviously not peak by itself. And it's obviously not just plateau pressure by itself. There has to be something else. So then they said, okay, well, let's look at driving pressure. So they resampled them again. They put, mixed them all up, put them all back together again in likeness. And they said, this time, let's put all of our driving pressures together. We got a peep of five and a, 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 a plateau of 20. Okay, that's a, that's a plat driving pressure of about 15. Let's keep that the same. So you can see the driving pressures between each of these are about the same. Look at the mortality. It became basically flat across the board. So what this shows is, is that while a, a, a plateau pressure over here had a higher mortality, 
The same plateau pressure over here did not have a higher mortality because the peak was higher. And this supports this idea of driving pressure being a marker of mortality. Now, other studies have gone on to, to, to illustrate that driving pressure beyond mortality also with a lower driving pressure reduces ventilator-induced lung injuries and pulmonary complications. So, if we can agree that there is something here good about driving pressure, then now let's just figure out a way to define it so we know what it is, so we can talk about it and explain it. Now, when we look at that, here's the formula. Driving pressure equals plateau minus peep. Now, have you ever seen this before? Most respiratory therapists have. Where have you seen it before? Well, let's take it a step further. Plateau minus peep pressure is the bottom side of the static compliance formula. We know that static compliance equals tidal volume divided by plateau minus peep. Interesting. So you're telling me, Joe, that what we can really say is that static compliance equals tidal volume divided by driving pressure. And that answer is yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. If you can adjust your mind to think that static compliance is tidal volume divided by driving pressure, then you're going to start thinking about driving pressure with every single patient assessment you do when you're looking at your plateaus and doing your ventilator assessments. And that's going to be a big thing. Now let's move this formula around one more time to get us to a working formula that will help us define what driving pressure is. If we get driving pressure over here by itself, we'll multiply both sides by driving pressure and then divide both sides by static compliance. You'll see that driving pressure equals tidal volume divided by static compliance. Now this right here is a working definition that helps us define driving pressure. You see what driving pressure is, is it is the ratio of tidal volume to static compliance. Now, what do we know about tidal volume? What do we typically set our tidal volumes at? We typically look at our patient's gender and their height, and we get an ideal body weight, and we set it at six mLs per kilogram. But that is not what driving pressure states. Because see, if we want to minimize driving pressure, then what it is is that we have to set an appropriate tidal volume in conjunction to our static compliance. If you have a, a tidal volume, even if it's 6 mLs per kilogram, but in the presence of a very, very reduced static compliance, then that is going to result in a high driving pressure because while that tidal volume may be appropriate based off of ideal body weight, it is not appropriate based off of the patient's static compliance resulting in an increased driving pressure. So we, we, could, we could essentially learn to use this to be an indicator to the appropriateness of our set tidal volume based off of our patient's static compliance. I got one more illustration I want to show you here to make this kind of ring, maybe make a little bit more sense. Uh, this right here is just going to illustrate four different elements of what happens during inspiration. So with this first one right here, we see that we're starting at expiration. And so this would be peak right here. And you can see in these regions right here, we're not even starting at a very good level of, of, of optimization of peak. We still have regions of the lungs that are not aerated. We just got a little bit of good aeration right here, right? Now, when we put a tidal volume on top of this small area, we see that what we essentially get is overstretching of that area. This leads to a higher driving pressure and a higher stress index and is eventually going to lead to pulmonary complications, ventilator-induced lung injuries, reduced positive patient outcomes. Now, the second one right here shows where we're starting basically in the same point. We're still not well aerated to begin with. But during inspiration, we get better distribution of alveolar gas. You see the difference here where we're coming down here with the tidal volume to where up here we basically just overstretch the healthy, healthy alveoli? Well, here we're getting better distribution. But because we started so low, we still get these elements of overstretching. 
This is going to lead to an increased driving pressure, increased stress index, and increased risk for pulmonary complications. Now C right here is the place where we want to be. You can see we're starting at a much better aerated region. We are starting at a place of well homogeneous distribution of gas. When we deliver the appropriate tidal volume on top of that peak level for that static compliance, then we see good aeration of all lung fields without overstretching or overstressing of any alveoli. This is going to lead to a minimizing driving pressure with a minimal stress index. This is what we're looking for. Hold the alveoli open at a place that leads us to good compliance and then give an appropriate tidal volume and we'll reduce risk for pulmonary complications, ventilator-induced lung injuries. I keep saying that over and over, but it's important to understand the connection between the two. Anytime we are overstretching alveoli, then pulmonary complications, ventilator-induced lung injuries, and, and other markers such as mortality are going to work in the negative favor of the patient. Now, this last one here basically shows where we are starting at a place of too much peak. So you can see these two little markers right here are saying, hey, we're starting at a place of overstretching. So if you start overstretched, then it doesn't matter what tidal volume you put in, it's going to lead to severe overstretching of the alveoli, which is going to lead to an increased driving pressure and an increased stress index. Now I tell you all of this just for you to hopefully have a better understanding of driving pressure. Hopefully uh, getting the mindset of monitoring it, talking about it with your colleagues, talking about it with your classmates, talking about it in the clinical situation with your physicians so that we understand that, that the future of mechanical ventilation, driving pressure is going to be a major player, more so than what it already is. I believe so much to the point that we will get to a point to where tidal volume is set based off of driving pressure. No more will we, will we be moving, uh, setting tidal volume based off of ideal body weight, but it will be more uh, revolving around this idea of static compliance and minimizing driving pressure because we know the research out there shows a reduction in negative outcomes for our patients when we do so. Hey, I hope you learned something in this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I look forward to your comments below. If you found any value in this video, I would appreciate a big thumbs up, smash the like button, and give me a subscription. Hit the subscribe button, turn on all bell notifications. You'll get notifications when I post new videos. And if you don't like them, you can always unsubscribe. I appreciate you being here. And to all my respiratory therapists, remember, average is easy, so don't be it.